We're going to continue on with this chapter and we're now going to talk about a financial statement called the statement of cash flows. Now this statement of cash flows is one of the financial statements and it measures activities involving our cash receipts and the cash disbursements or the payments over a period of time. We classify all cash transactions into three specific categories that correspond to business activities. We classify them as operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. Now operating activities or operating cash flows, cash inflows and outflows involve cash receipts and cash payments for transactions that relate to the normal operating of the business. They involve the revenues and the expenses of the business. Investing cash flows, the ins, the receipts and the disbursements, include cash transactions for the purchase and the sale of investments and productive long-term assets. And then we have the financing cash flows that include the uh, receipts and disbursements, those various transactions with lenders or creditors such as borrowing money from the bank and then repaying that money to the bank or repaying debt. And it also involves uh, transactions with shareholders such as issuing stock and paying dividends. This would also involve something that we'll uh, talk about down the road called treasury stock also. So here you're going to see a uh, statement of cash flows for our company called Eagle Golf Academy. Now as you see here the total of the net cash flows from the operating activities, the investing, and the financing activities are going to equal the net change in cash during the period. So this is going to be the cash um, throughout the period here. The change in cash is going to equal the operating cash flows plus the investing cash flows plus the financing cash flows. Now the ending balance of cash is going to be the same as that that's going to be reported on the balance sheet. This reconciliation of the beginning and the ending cash balances show that the statement of cash flows explains why the cash reported in the balance sheet changed from one period to the next period. So in this example the beginning balance of cash is zero because it was the first year of this company. The beginning balance of cash next year will be the ending balance of cash on this year. Okay. So let's do a problem so we can kind of create a cash flow statement ourselves. Exercise 1-9 in the book shows us that Tiger Trade has the following cash transactions uh, for this period. Now as you see here we've got cash received from the sale of products to customers for 40000 cash received from the bank for a long-term loan 45000 cash paid to purchase factory equipment of 50000 cash paid to merchandise suppliers for 12 cash received from the sale of an unused warehouse is uh, 13,000 um, cash paid to workers 24,000 cash paid for advertisement 4,000 cash received for the sale of services to customers 30,000 and then cash paid for dividends to stockholders is 6,000 so as you see here We've got various items that are receipts or disbursements, but activities related to 
cash. And as you see, they're all various transactions. So what we are going to do is break them down into um, various transactions. Now we're going to start, uh, let's just look and see what it says. Calculate the ending balance of cash, assuming the balance of cash at the beginning of the period is 5000 So we know it starts with $5,000. So we're going to definitely start beginning balance is five and then what we're going to do is we're going to add the cash received and subtract the cash that was paid out so if we just take our list here we're going to plus increase cash by those amounts received subtract decrease cash from those amounts that were dispersed or paid out. So we've got <clears throat> cash received from the sale of products to customers, 40,000 increases our cash. Cash received from the bank for a loan, that increases our cash we received that money. Cash paid to purchase factory equipment, well we used up cash so we're decreasing cash. Cash paid to merchandise suppliers, again we decreased our cash. Cash received from the sale of unused a warehouse. We sold a warehouse. We are receiving cash. Cash paid to workers. Again, we paid it out. Cash paid for advertisement, paid it out. Cash received for the sale of services to customers. We received that money. <clears throat> cash paid for dividends. That also was paid out. So our ending balance will be 37000 Now the next thing <clears throat> this exercise wants us to do is to create a cash flow statement. Now the key with the cash flow statement is to break up the items between operating activities, which are the day-to-day -day activities, the um, investing activities, and then the financing activities. So we're going to look at these various transactions and categorize them into three types of activities. So I'm going to show you the cash flow statement so you understand how we went about doing this. We start by segregating or separating those activities. Operating, we're going to do the inflows and the outflows and then come up with a net for the operating activities. Then we're going to do the same with investing and financing. Now remember, operating activities are just normal day-to-day -day activities. Why the company is in business. So we're going to take the sale of products to customers and services to customers. Those are the inflows of cash we get. The outflows would be purchasing merchandise, paying salaries, and advertising expenses. So we're going to take those and as you can see here um, cash paid to workers, cash paid for advertisement, and cash paid to merchandise suppliers. We're going to take those and those are going to be a part of our cash outflows from operating activities. Again, this is the normal course of operations, why the company's in business. So if we, again, are going to start with zero because, um, oh, excuse me, the company started with $5,000. That's down here. Um, but in this statement of cash flows, we're going to take our um, inflows, subtract our outflows, and come up with a net cash flows from operating activities of $30,000. we are going to do the same with our investing activities. Remember, investing activities have to do with long-term purposes of um, for the company. Purchasing factory equipment would be an outflow. Receiving money from the sale of a warehouse would be um, inflows of cash. So between those two, which is all we have there for investing, we have a minus 37,000 of net cash flows from investing activities. And then our financing activities include 
borrowing money from the bank, paying money back, receiving stock from investors, and paying dividends. Well, in this case, we only have two items too, borrowing money from the bank and paying dividends. So we've got net cash flows from financing of a plus 39,000. So if we take the 30 minus the 37 plus the 39, for this period, we've increased our cash 32,000. Again, if you, the 30,000 is a plus, minus 37,000, that ends up being a minus 7,000. Then you add to that the 39,000, that ends up being a plus 32,000. We then take the cash at the beginning of the period, which is $5,000, and we have cash at the end of the year of $37,000. <clears> Let's move and look at another problem. So here we've got Squirrel, let me find it here, okay. Squirrel Tree Services reports the following amounts on December 31st. So we've got um, a balance sheet. We've got cash of 7,700, supplies of 1,800, prepaid insurance 3,500, and a building of 72,000. Then our liabilities and stockholders equity section shows accounts payable of 9700 salaries payable of 3500 notes payable of 20000 common stock of 40000 and retained earnings of 11800 in addition the company reported the following cash flows so it tells us the inflows customers of 60 borrowing from the bank of 20 sale of investments 10 and then our outflows would be employee salaries of 22, supplies of four, dividends of 6,500, and purchasing a building for 62,000. So this gives us our information. They want us to prepare a balance sheet and then prepare a statement of cash flows with all this information. So let's look at the balance sheet. Again, we've got our information here for us. We've got our assets, and remember a balance sheet is the accounting equation. Assets equal our liabilities plus our stockholders equity. So as you see here, we've got our cash of 7,700, our supplies of 1,800, our prepaid insurance of 3,500, and our building of 72,000. If we total that column, our total assets are 85,000. Remember, assets are resources that are used by a company. Now, assets will always equal liabilities plus our owner's equity. We have liabilities of accounts payable. These are claims to creditors. Salaries payable, we owe salaries to our employees and notes payable. So our total liabilities are 33,200. Our stockholders equity section involves the common stock of 40,000, our retained earnings of 118. So our stockholders equity section gives us our common stock of 40, the retained earnings of 118 would involve I'm going to move back one here. The common stock here of 40, the retained earnings of 11.8. So we've got 51.8. Again, our liabilities plus our stockholders' equity are going to be equal to our assets. So our liabilities of 33.2, our stockholders' equity of 51.8 equals our 85,000. Do you see here how our assets, 85,000, equal our liabilities? plus our stockholders' equity of 85000 also. Okay, the next thing is to prepare a statement of cash flows. So what we'll do here is we will um, start with our operating activities, then we'll go on to our investing activities, 
and then our financing activities. So as you see here, it gave us some information of cash inflows and cash outflows. So our cash inflows, the uh, customers, um, monies we receive from customers would be operating activities. Our salaries, our supplies, those would be outflows of operating activities. So you see we've got cash inflows from customers of 60, cash outflows for salaries of 22, cash outflows for supplies of 4. So our 60 minus our 22,000 minus our 4,000 gives us net cash flows from operating activities of 34,000. Then our next section, our investing activities, provide us with the sale of investments for long-term purposes and then purchasing a building. So our inflows minus our outflows gives us a net of negative 52,000 for cash flows from investing activities. Then our financing activities is operating, uh, uh, excuse me, borrowing money from the bank. In taking out a loan, we receive 20,000 in cash. In paying dividends, it's a minus 6,500. So our net cash flows from financing is 13,5. So if we take the three categories, and combine them, we have our net cash flows from operating activities of 34,000 minus our 52,000 plus our financing activities of 135 give us a decrease in cash of 4,500. From there, we need to figure out what our cash is at the beginning of the year. If we go back here, do you see how it tells us our cash at, no it doesn't, it tells us our cash at the end of the year, 7,700. So we know our cash at the end of the year is 7,700. So the way we can figure out our cash at the beginning of the year is to take how we, uh, the cash that happened transpired throughout the year and subtract that from what our cash is at the end of the year, or actually in this case we would add the two because we decreased our cash throughout the year, which means we started with a greater cash balance at the beginning of the year. So we had to plug in that number in order to figure out our cash at the beginning of the year. So as you see, throughout this chapter, we're talking about the various financial statements. This slide helps you see the link among the various financial statements of this Eagle Golf Academy. This will show you that the net income from the income statement, as you see right here, the $1,200, flows to the statement of stockholders equity. You see how we add the net income for the period here of 1200. And it ultimately becomes a part of the retained earnings section. And comes in here into play with the stockholders equity section. So this income gets linked to the stockholders equity as part of the retained earnings. And then we show that after we calculate that retained earnings, the amount of the total stockholders equity gets reported in the balance sheet. You see the stockholders equity here of 26 flows back to our balance sheet of 26. Now finally, we can see in the statement of cash flows that the balance of cash in the balance sheet equals the amount of cash reported in the statement of cash flows. So as you see the 6900 in cash shows as our ending cash balance at the end of the year. So this is helpful in seeing that 
we usually start with an income statement. From the income statement, then we can create our statement of stockholders' equity. And then once we have that information, we can create our balance sheet. So they all link together in a fashion. Okay, so our next um, exercise, we're going to look at some situations and we're going to try to figure out the missing link. So each of the following situations represents amounts shown on four basic financial statements. We're supposed to fill in the missing blanks using our information on what we've come up with already. So let's look at the first one. Revenues equal 27000 Expenses equal 18000 Well, what would our net income be? So if you look here at an example of an income statement, if we take our revenues, 27, expenses of 18, we would have net income of $9,000. Next, we've got one that shows an increase in stockholders' equity of 17000 an issuance of common stock for eleven, net income, twelve. What would our dividends be? So we're going to pull up a statement of stockholders' equity to gain an understanding of the flow of the information. We'll go to the next slide and we'll see here that if we take the um, increase in stockholders equity down here is going to be 17, issuance of common stock of 11, net income increase of 12, our dividends to plug in this figure would have to be $6,000 for our increase in stockholders' equity to ultimately be $17,000. Our last one here, assets of $24,000, stockholders' equity of fifteen. dollars what would our liabilities be? So we're going to look at a balance sheet, and if we see our assets of 24, if our stockholder's equity is 15, and we know assets equal our liabilities plus our stockholder's equity, then that means our liabilities would have to be $9,000. Okay, so we're going to I guess we have one more here, the um, statement of cash flows. So our total change in cash during the period is going to be 26000 Our net operating cash flow is going to be 34 Our net investing is a minus 17 What would our net financing be? So if we put in the figures, operating a 34 Investing of 17, we know the net increase is 26. So what would the financing activities need to be? We take the 34 minus the 17. And then from that, 17, what do we need to increase and get a net increase of cash of 26? We'd need 9,000 in order to get that net increase of cash. So as we move on here, I hope these different exercises are helpful for you. Um, that's the whole purpose of me doing them, is my hope is that you gain some understanding. All transactions that affect revenues or expenses are reported in the income statement, and they ultimately affect the balance sheet through the balance in retained earnings. Remember, looking back on this statement here, 
revenues minus expenses are what accounts are put into the income statement. That net income ultimately goes through retained earnings. Okay, now the last section here that we're going to talk about um, quickly, uh, it relates to how all of this, all of this work we're doing ultimately allows stakeholders to make decisions. The whole reason we analyze the various transactions and create these reports are so people can make decisions with this information. So financial accounting information is essential in having good business decisions and making those good business decisions. This slide demonstrates that various stakeholders, investors, creditors, that have cash and they decide where they're willing to invest. How do they decide which investment options provide better opportunities? Usually they analyze companies' financial accounting information in making their decisions. So they will gather information and from that information decide which is the best scenario for them to make decisions. To demonstrate how important financial accounting information is in making investment decisions, if we look at the relationship between the changes in stock prices um, and changes in net income over 20 years, there's not another piece of information that better explains a company's stock price performance than does the net income from companies which is basically the bottom line. So as you see from the charts, if you're able to predict the change in financial accounting's profitability measurement or net income, then you'll also be able to predict the change in stock prices accordingly with that. So remember how we started this chapter. The purpose of accounting is to serve, for financial accounting, to serve two functions. Measuring business activities and then communicating those activities with um, uh, stakeholders to help make decisions. One item in accounting that is significant that you're going to learn more about is called GAAP. Generally, accepted accounting principles. GAAP is used and is created for accountants to follow standard guidelines in uh, preparing financial statements. Because financial accounting is so vital to investors and to creditors, there have been formal standards that have been established. So the rules of financial accounting are these generally accepted accounting principles. And the fact that all companies use these same rules is really important for financial statement users because they've got to be able to make them comparative. It helps investors, investors compare information among companies when they're trying to make decisions. Now, financial accounting and reporting standards um, in the United States are established primarily by a board called the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board. This is an independent private sector with full-time voting members and a real large support staff. The people who run this are generally people from the accounting profession and large companies, uh, large, people from large corps, financial analysts, and government agencies. Now, the global, that's in the United States, the global counterpart to FASB is the International Accounting Standards Board. And in many ways, it operates similar to FASB. Now, in the United States, 
The Securities Exchange Commission, or the SEC, is the government agency that was created back in 1934 that basically um, is responsible for FASB and for setting the reporting company. So the SECs basically said, we don't want to handle this, but we're going to delegate and give the FASB the responsibility of setting these various standards to adhere to. Remember that the rules of financial accounting are called GAAP. The FASB is the independent body that sets the, the uh, financial standards in the United States. We are going to, again, I keep telling you we're going to barely touch on certain things, but we really are on this one, the auditors. To make sure management really applies GAAP accordingly, the Securities and Exchange Commission requires that there are independent outside verification of financial statements of publicly traded companies. So these independent exams are done by uh, people called auditors. They're not employees of the company, but they're hired by the company as an independent party to express opinions on the financial statements to make sure that they are prepared in accordance to these uh, rules that are required in the United States through FASB called GAAP. And the auditors uh, check the company out and do testing to make sure that they can issue what's called an opinion to say that the financial statements of this company are free from any material misstatements. Now, it's important because in this day and age, we just can't trust that people prepare financial statements appropriately. We've had a lot of wrongdoing in our country, and as a result, um, we require outside um, independent uh, professionals to verify the accuracy. These auditors play a significant role in investors and creditors decisions because they help add some credibility to the financial statements that a company issues. Remember, when you're a public company, you've got a privilege in that people can invest in your stock. And as a re uh, requirement of having that privilege, the SEC requires that these financial statements get audited. Here's an example of um, an auditor's report from Dick Sporting's Dick Sporting Good. So the report that the auditors create, and this is just a little segment of it, uh, indicates that the financial statements for the period mentioned have been prepared in conformity with generally accepted um, accounting principles. So this is a standard report by an auditor. Um, it's usually issued to the board of directors of the company and it explains what they've done and it um, highlights the all the financial statements and they are responsible for expressing an opinion. And so um, as you see down here at the bottom that the results of their operations and cash flows are in conformity with the accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. So again, our um, objectives of financial reporting is useful for investors and creditors to help them make good decisions. It also helps us predict cash flows and it tells about economic resources claims to those resources and changes in resources and claims. So GAP, as we see, again, is that set of standards and rules that are recognized as a general guide for financial reporting. Remember GAP 
are the rules created for the United States uh, companies. The Securities Exchange Commission requires GAAP, and the Securities Exchange Commission has given the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, the go-ahead to develop those rules and guidelines for the United States. The conceptual framework provides the underlying foundation for the development of accounting standards and the interpretation of accounting information. So this um, uh, framework involves qualitative characteristics, enhancing qualitative characteristics, cost effectiveness constraint, and these various underlying assumptions we're going to talk about. So basically, we want information that provides good benefits for good decision making. Quality, quality characteristics means that this um, information can make a difference. The underlying assumptions are basic assumptions made to support these generally um, accepted accounting principles. The assumptions involve an economic entity assumption, the monetary unit assumption, the periodicity assumption, and something called the going concern. Now basically, what this entails is that the economic entity means that we can identify all economic events with a particular economic entity. So in other words, Dick's Sporting Goods, the transactions involved with Dick's Sporting Goods are for Dick's Sporting Goods. They're not for the nail salon next door to Dick's Sporting Goods. The economic entity are the transactions for just Dick's Sporting Goods, not the CEO's personal finances. The monetary unit assumption is in order to measure financial statement elements, we need a unit or scale of measurement. And in the United States, we use the dollar. That's the appropriate common denominator we use to express information about financial statements and the changes in those elements. So our monetary unit is we don't use the ruble, we don't use the peso, we use the US dollar. We all understand the US dollar. The periodicity assumption takes the life of a company and divides it into artificial time periods for financial reporting. So companies such as Dick Sporting or Nike, because they're public companies, they are required to provide financial information to the Securities Exchange Commission on a quarterly basis. And of course, they're also supposed to provide it on an annual basis, but it's as often as quarterly. Then last, the assumption that's called the going concern assumption states that in the absence of information to the contrary, we assume a business entity will continue to operate indefinitely. So we don't assume that companies are just going to fold up tomorrow. It provides justification for measuring assets based on their original costs. So as we wind this up, which of the following assumptions indicates that the life of a company can be divided into artificial time periods for periodic reporting? Was that the economic entity, the periodicity, the going concern, or the monetary unit? Hope you get that one. The periodicity states the economic life is divided into artificial time periods for financial reporting. There you have it. I know this is a lot to absorb, but it's really important that you start off this course really um, gaining an understanding of various aspects because this course is going to build. Each chapter builds on the previous chapter. So take time to go over a lot of the exercises 
that I'm going to um, show in lectures and make sure you go into or complete this chapter really having an, an understanding of the different concepts we've mastered so far in this chapter. So certain corporations such as like Nike whose securities are invested um, excuse me here in a period of time 